Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Mario Guajardo. I'm a software engineer here in the networking group at Google. Uh, I'm honored to introduce our speaker today. Uh, this is part of a speaker series we are trying to start called Perspectivas, where we uh, invite uh, Hispanics and Latinos that have worked in sciences and engineering and in the IT industry and so that they can provide like mentoring at scale and share a little bit of their personal story, uh, but most importantly uh, to share what they currently work on and the exciting technologies they are invested. Uh, we have a great speaker uh, today. He is the president and CEO of uh, Green Momentum, which is a, a startup here in Silicon Valley that does uh, market intelligence uh, for the creation and dissemination of the green industry uh, throughout Mexico and Latin America. He's also a founder of an NGO uh, called Green Impulse 2.0 that has a similar objective, which is to promote the industry and the creation of uh, high-end uh, green jobs in Latin America. And he's also the chairman of the CleanTech uh, Challenge uh, for Latin America, which is a, a program that he probably will explain more about that is also aligned uh, to uh, strengthening and uh, stimulating uh, the upcoming opportunities. Uh, and today, uh, to talk about uh, clean tech and the challenges and opportunities in Latin America, uh, let, let us welcome uh, Luis Aguirre Torres. Thank you, Mario. And thank you, everybody, for, for being here. And I'm honored uh, by the invitation. Uh, Mario asked me to, before I start, talk a little bit about uh, why I'm here and why I'm talking to you and why you should pay attention or not to what I have to say today. Uh, just the, the very quick version is I, uh, I'm, a, I'm Mexican. I was born in Mexico. Uh, I studied, I had my first degree in computer engineering in Mexico. And then after that, I went to study in England. I did a master's and a PhD in electronic engineering in, in the University of London. I, I worked in Europe uh, for a few years, uh, mostly in the telecom industry. And that's the way I came to the US. I ended up uh, coming here, working for AT&T uh, in the telecom industry too. Uh, and it was then when I started just talking to startup companies and technology firms here in Silicon Valley. And, and when I started thinking, well, I probably should go to Silicon Valley because it's where, where everything happens. And so I took the first opportunity I had, which was to work with an Israeli company. Uh, to my surprise, the Israeli company hired me in Silicon Valley, but then they sent me to Tel Aviv, and then they sent me to Singapore. And so my dream of coming and working in Silicon Valley was really just to come and set up a house here, because then I was all the time in, in Israel and, and Southeast Asia. Uh, but then I, I, I started getting involved more in, in, in market development, business development areas, and, and then I, I got more interested in, in the type of business and the type of activities that you could have in emerging markets specifically the Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, and eventually Latin America. At some point, I started thinking, actually, I need to tell the truth here. My wife started telling me that I should do something important with my life. And, you know, uh, as anybody who's been married knows, uh, we just do what the wife says. And so I did that, and uh, I, I moved to, to clean tech. Uh, for me, clean tech was a way of uh, doing my part. What I wanted to do was to promote clean technology, promote ways of helping the environment, but also uh, a part that was really important for me and eventually became uh, one of the most important parts of the company was to, to promote sustainability. And here I'm talking about sustainable development in the sense that I want to promote uh, a balance in, in technology development, the economy and society. I want to make sure that if we are for real migrating to a green economy from an oil economy to a green economy, uh, that we are going to do it right and we are going to benefit also communities. And, and then being from Mexico, the, the company started focusing on, on those communities that we knew, uh, that is Latin America. So eventually we, uh, with other partners here in Silicon Valley, we founded uh, Green Momentum. And Green Momentum is a market intelligence firm focused on promoting and accelerating the development of clean technology in Latin America. So this is the very long answer to a very quick question that Mario had. And uh, 
So I'm going to take it from here and I'm going to start the presentation. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions at any point. I think it's better if we have a conversation rather than you just uh, looking at me and looking at the slides, right? So I should have shown this slide when I was talking because, you know, it's part of what I was going to say. But also, uh, Mario mentioned something, and I want to mention it very quickly here. Uh, we also founded uh, something that is called uh, Green Impulse, Impulso Verde 2.0, 2.0. Basically, Impulso Verde, what it does, it, it promotes green jobs. It promotes the creation of high-quality green jobs uh, for uh, Latin America. So this goes hand in hand with the objectives of, of Green Momentum. Green Momentum is the for-profit part of the organization. Impulso Verde is the non-profit part of the organization. And, and together, we, we work on different projects. So the idea of me coming here today was to talk about uh, opportunities in the clean tech industry, mostly in Latin America. Uh, but to do this, we need to first agree on what we're talking about here. First, we need to agree on what we, we, we mean by clean tech. Clean tech, which refers to clean technologies, is a term that has been coined by specifically a group called the Clean Tech Group. The Clean Tech Group has been using this term for a while. and. It's a term that investors, uh, VCs use to refer to an industry that has knowledge-based products and services uh, that are focused on improving performance, productivity, and mostly helping uh, the environment by eliminating uh, CO2 emissions. There is another group, a uh, consultancy firm called Clean Edge, that has a slightly different uh, interpretation of what the word is, but at the end of the day, we're all talking about the same thing. We're talking about products and services that can be used to eliminate CO2 emissions or harness renewable materials and energy sources. The whole idea is to cut emissions and reduce waste. When we talk about clean tech, and uh, this happens all the time uh, whenever we, we are in a conference, people get confused with uh, sustainability, sustainable development, uh, clean tech, how it all relates. So I think it is also important to talk about what sustainability means. Sustainability comes from Latin sostenere, which means to endure, to persist. Basically, when we talk about sustainability, we talk about the ability of an ecosystem to survive uh, given the specific conditions throughout time. Uh, then there is the term of uh, sustainable development. Sustainable development was properly defined by the Brundtland Commission of the United Nations uh, in 1997, which uh, talks about the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations. Basically, we're talking about intergenerational equity here. Equity? Equality? <laughs> Sorry, just get confused with the words. Um, and then when we talk about sustainability in, uh, and sustainable development, it's what I was trying to, uh, to explain at the beginning. We're, we're trying to find a balance between the, the development of technology, uh, economic growth, and society. We want to make sure that everything is fair in every sense. And if we manage to get that balance, that equilibrium, we find a point in which we, we, we can grow and we can uh, ensure the future of uh, the, next the next generations. So when we talk about sustainability, according to the United Nations Environment Program and the World Wild uh, Fund, uh, we talk about improving the quality of human life while living within the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity of uh, biological species in an environment is the, is the population size of the species that the environment can sustain indefinitely. So when we talk about carrying capacity, we're talking about how much can our planet support, right? How much can we live? And, and it's very easy to see this in terms of food, in terms of water, environmental conditions, and living space. So when we talk about this, uh, always the topic of population increase comes to mind. So when we are talking about sustainable development, sustainability, we are talking about carrying capacity, and then we have to talk about population increase. Uh, I, I know that Al Gore was here recently, and, and he was talking about probably what he's been talking about lately, which is climate change, and also what climate change has to do with population growth and what it has to do with uh, the future of our planet. Uh, when we talk about uh, the population increase, we, 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 can, we, we always focus on developing countries. We always focus on the birth rate that has uh, increased in, in countries like Mexico, Latin America, China, and India. 
Uh, most of the increase uh, has indeed come from, from this part of the world, has uh, apparently, the, according to, an, I don't know the numbers by heart, uh, we, it has raised from 5.6 billion to 7.5, well, it will raise to 7.9 billion by 2050. So this, this presents a very important risk for all of us, for the entire planet. If we continue to grow uh, the way we're doing, if the population continues to increase, particularly in developing countries like Latin America, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, we are gonna find ourselves in an ecological deficit. And when we find ourselves in an ecological deficit, that is the carrying capacity cannot support the current growth of the population and meet the needs of the population, then we need to start finding unsustainable ways of compensating. And when we do this, we start looking at world trade, which is uh, probably the most uh, common way of, of trying to meet these unsustainable extra resources. But also we start uh, relying on, on things like fossil fuels, uh, which, uh, Normally, we, we talk about it as coming from the past, because when we say coming from the future, we're also talking about exploiting resources that are, not, uh, that are gonna disappear if we continue exploiting them the way we are. So, and in, in, this, in, in this sense, we, we need to understand what the, the current capacity of the world is today, what it has to do with the population growth, and what it has to do with what we have to do from now on. So when I, was, uh, when I started talking about this, I was, I was talking about uh, clean tech and the relationship it has with sustainability, with carrying capacity, and with population growth. Uh, the, the relationship is directly related to consumption and directly related to the way we are going to consume the environmental resources in our planet. This has led, according to many experts and scientists, has led to what is called climate change. And everybody's familiar, at least with the term. Uh, but basically, what, what it means is that the current conditions of the environment, given the amount of uh, CO2 equivalent gases that are in the atmosphere, uh, have caused an increase in temperature uh, in our planet. According to scientists, if uh, the temperature were to rise more than two centigrade uh, within the next uh, several years, we'll have a catastrophic uh, scenario for the world. So here is where, where things get really interesting, right? So far, for the, in the past 50 years, temperature has increased uh, 0.6 degrees. And we're expecting that within the next 40 years, temperature could increase 2 degrees to centigrade, which means uh, we're going to die if that happens. So what we need to do is we need to prevent that from happening. We need to make sure that we do what we can to reduce the emissions of, of greenhouse gases that are the ones that will cause this increase in temperature. So the way we do this is by promoting uh, the decarbonization of the environment and the world. And the way we do this is by exploiting renewable energy sources. And by doing that, we, we, and in order to do that, we need to develop what, what are called clean technologies. So this was a very long uh, way of going around, but this is the relationship. This is why clean tech is important. It's, it's not just a business opportunity. It has to do with our own survival and the survival of the planet. So now that we are talking about this uh, still, uh, everybody has heard about the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol that was a initially conceived in 1992 at the Earth Summit, but really signed in Kyoto in 1997, uh, was not ratified uh, by the United States and China and other countries, uh, but a total of 189 countries up until 2000, November 2005 signed to the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol, basically what it says is, we are gonna commit all together to reduce uh, emissions by 5.2%. The entire world is going to get together and try to reduce emissions by that amount. But that doesn't mean that everybody's going to reduce emissions in the same amount. It just means that the ones that pollute more are going to have to reduce emissions uh, uh, more than the ones that pollute less. And only 37 industrialized nations are uh, committed to do this. The rest of the world uh, is doing it in a voluntary basis. So the, pro the Kyoto Protocol is bound to expire. It's going to expire in, in 2012. 
Uh, so what we're trying to do right now is get together, the whole world is trying to get together and come up with a replacement, with a replacement for the Kyoto Protocol. And this is expected, was expected to happen in Copenhagen at the end of the year, actually starting Monday next week. Uh, right now, uh, things are not looking great. Things are actually looking terrible and we find ourselves in a situation where Developing countries are facing off developed countries and trying to agree on very specific things, such as who is responsible for what's happened. And, and this is a very interesting argument because uh, right now China is saying that they are responsible for the most emissions in the world. However, they are still a developing country. Their economy is still growing. And nobody limited the growth of the U.S. when their economy was growing by limiting emissions. So right now the debate is whether uh, countries like China need to be subject to a binding agreement with the rest of the world. And also at the same time we have the developing countries, we have the poorest countries in the world who are demanding financial aid. And countries like the US are supposed to give them money. And it, this is calculated in about $100 billion a year. So right now Europe, the US, and all developed nations are trying to agree with developing nations as to how much money they have to give them for this. And when we talk about this, uh, one, one of the points that, that people are uh, in disagreement right now uh, is how much do we have to reduce in terms of emissions? We are talking about preventing an increase in temperature in the next 40 years. So we need to do this by reducing CO2 emissions. So how much do we have to reduce? And right now the U.S., for example, is uh, suggesting that using 2005 as a baseline, they are going to reduce in 17% the emissions by 2020. And countries like China are suggesting uh, a reduction of 40 to 45% by 2050. Also, but none of this has been uh, signed in, in any document. Nobody has agreed yet on this. But one of the things that, uh, that normally happens is when I tell you that we're going to reduce uh, 50 million tons of uh, CO2, it means little to most people because most people have no idea what that means. So very quickly, what is it when we say 1 million tons of CO2 equivalent? We're talking about more than 170,000 passenger vehicles. We're talking about 24% of the annual emissions uh, released by coal burning power plants. So, so in, for you to have an idea, uh, we have country, oh, actually the numbers are coming in, in a little bit. So when we talk about emissions, uh, we, we can tell uh, based on the industrialization of each country, uh, which are the largest polluters in the world. And by looking at this map, you can tell that the US and China are one and two, and then comes India and Russia very close. Uh, if we look at the numbers specifically, I don't know if you can, if you can see the numbers uh, from there, but we can see that China, the U.S., and Europe as a bloc are, are the largest polluters in the world. Except for China and the U.S., Europe and some of the top 10 polluters in the world uh, ratified the Kyoto Protocol. What that means is that as a group, they decided in 1997 uh, that they were going to reduce their emissions, that they were going to try to reduce emissions, and then different mechanisms were implemented, uh, and they are called collectively the uh, clean development mechanisms, which are, uh, were created for those countries that pollute the most, those that are our top 10 uh, here, except, as I said, for China and the, China and the U.S. Uh, these mechanisms were created so they could, if not lower their emissions, pay for somebody else to lower their emissions and in that way uh, balance off uh, somehow the amount of emissions that they have. In 2001, which is when uh, enough quorum was gathered to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, it started a very interesting thing in the world. People started investing in technology in order to clean the world. They, people start investing in what we call clean technologies. And this, uh, and, and this was a question that I got in a conference very recently, which is what is the, the, the direct relation that we can find in, in this policy at the UN level, at the federal government level, with the development of clean technology, with the development of a whole industry. And 
here, uh, normally I, I answer with a very clear example, and we are in California, and this is the best example that you can have. California, the, the governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, basically passed in 2006 the Assembly Bill 32. AB 32 basically means, to put it simple, that California needs to pollute less, that every industry in California needs to reduce their emissions, that utility companies need to provide energy from renewable sources up to 20%, and recently this year, with the Executive Order 12, uh, the governor increased this to 30%, basically asking all utility companies to produce uh, energy from renewable energy sources. And this wasn't an option. This was law, and because of this law, companies started scrambling trying to meet uh, these requirements. And what happens? We're in California, we're in Silicon Valley, we're in the place where all the entrepreneurs are thinking all the time what to do next. So they found an opportunity. Policy influenced investment. Investment brought new innovation and technology, and a new industry was created. Based on AB32, a whole new industry in Silicon Valley was created. And since last year, when the little financial crisis started, the only place that had a negative unemployment in clean tech was Silicon Valley. Basically. When we're talking about California, we can translate this into a, a whole country, right? California is arguably the fifth economy of the world. Uh, so basically what happened in California could happen at the country level, in the US, in China, and many other places. And this happened. When, as I was saying, after uh, 2001, when countries started trying to find ways of uh, cleaning the environment, of developing uh, renewable energy, uh, things started uh, to move in, in the investment community. So if we look at how much money was invested in clean technology, uh, according to the United Nations Environment Program and New Energy Finance, about $155 billion were invested in 2008. This includes asset financing, this includes uh, direct investment from uh, venture capital firms, and this uh, includes financing for uh, new energy sources in developing and developed countries. The, the amount of, of uh, investment uh, was divided uh, in basically four key technologies and then uh, all the rest, to put it somehow. Uh, sorry, is this too small? Can you read or should I read it for you? I guess it's, it's okay. Well, uh, last year, uh, solar got uh, the, bigger, uh, the biggest piece of the pie with $5.5 uh, billion. Most of the investment uh, went to Europe and the US, and about 30% of that investment in solar came to specifically Silicon Valley. Uh, biofuel and wind uh, also got investment from uh, VC firms, and then efficiency and infrastructure for electric vehicles and batteries. Uh, 2009 uh, presented a very interesting change because up until this point, uh, biotechnology was the number one uh, industry in terms of uh, investment. Uh, on the, in the third quarter of 2009, it was clean tech for the very first time that took the, the, first, uh, the top spot. Biotech was second to clean tech in terms of investment. This granted what happened because of the stimulus package. Obama devoted a lot of money to, to promoting the smart grid and to promote uh, renewable energy sources. So that's why a lot of the investment came this way. But this has created some momentum and it is expected to continue. Uh, maybe biotech and clean tech are gonna continue playing but, uh, for, the, for the top spot. But basically, clean tech has gained enough momentum to stay and continue increasing in terms of investment. Um, in terms of asset financing, uh, we can see that uh, wind uh, took the first uh, spot. Uh, wind technology and wind farms in the US and in Europe uh, started uh, growing. In, in Europe, we have uh, the largest number of uh, wind farms. And here in the US, we have, uh, and, and actually this is a very interesting thing because I think Germany is the number one country in terms of installed capacity for wind farms, but the U.S. is the number one in terms of production. So the efficiency of the wind farms in, in the U.S. is much greater than in other places. Also, uh, offshore wind farms, uh, which 
were only available in Europe. Now they are being developed here in the US. They are talking about a project in the, in the Great Lakes. They are talking about a project in Maine and other countries like Australia and also in the Southern Hemisphere, other countries are developing uh, offshore wind farms. So in terms of uh, where the money went, and uh, this is, uh, the, the information here is, is very interesting to put it somehow. Uh, at the World Environment Day in June, uh, the Under Secretary for the United Nations, also the director of the UN Environment Program, Achim Steiner, was presenting this report where they were saying that uh, $155 billion were invested in clean technologies worldwide. And he said that approximately 25% of that went to developing countries. Uh, this was not necessarily right. If you look at the, at the report, developing countries uh, took about 15% uh, of the investment at the end. Uh, but from the amount of money that went to uh, developing countries, half of it went to China and the other half went almost entirely to uh, Latin America. So the, the translation of the numbers that appear in this report is, uh, is very interesting, the way it's worded. Uh, it's kind of confusing if you ever look at this report. But at the end of the day, uh, what was discussed at the World Environment Day was that uh, a lot of the money is coming finally to emerging countries. Uh, it is, uh, people believe that uh, the, develop, the developed nations are reaching a point of uh, saturation uh, in some sectors such as solar and beginning to reach uh, saturation in, in other areas such as wind, and developing countries are benefiting from this. So we were talking about carbon emissions uh, by region and by country. And if we look at uh, this also from uh, electricity consumption, we can see that there is a direct correlation. The, the top uh, 15 countries would be the same. We're talking about countries with the highest population also are the countries that require uh, the most energy and require to produce the most energy. This is also related to population density. Uh, if we look at emerging markets, we, if we look at developing countries such as China or we look at Latin America, we can see that uh, these are the poster child for population density. The largest cities in the world are in developing countries. And this is directly related to energy consumption, energy production, and CO2 emissions. So if we look at the world in terms of population, we, we can start trying to identify where the opportunities will come at the end of the day. If we manage to relate population uh, growth, population density, energy consumption, CO2 emissions, we are also trying to find opportunities to invest in clean technologies. So we can see from here that uh, China, India, the US, Brazil, and Mexico are some of the top uh, countries in terms of population. But a very interesting way of looking at this is what's gonna happen in the future. Uh, in 19, I think it is 1946, uh, only 1.6% 1 of the world's population was living in urban areas. Now it is 47%. So in the last 50 years, most of the world has moved into the big cities. And this has happened mostly in developing countries. Right now, if we, this is a log, logarithmic uh, graph, uh, so it's not entirely evident, but you can tell that Africa and Latin America uh, are increasing in terms of population and they are projected to increase at a higher rate than most regions in the world. So if we put one, and one together, we can start looking at this as an opportunity. We can start looking at this as an opportunity for a, an industry that is being developed to clean the environment, to mitigate the effects that CO2 emissions are having on the environment. So going specifically to Latin America, Latin America has 569 million people uh, in 20 countries. We are not counting 10 uh, uh, dependencies or whatever they are called, uh, different departments. Uh, the largest cities in Latin America are really in, in the top countries. They are in Mexico, they are in Brazil, they are in Argentina, Chile, Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru. These 
are the countries that coincidentally are investing right now in clean technologies. They are the countries that are trying to promote uh, the use of renewable energy and a way of mitigating uh, CO2 emissions. So this is probably difficult to see, but uh, we're talking about uh, CO2 emissions per capita. And if you could see the numbers <laughs> on the screen, uh, you would see that Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina have the highest uh, number of CO2 emissions per capita, which the reason is next to the population is because it's coincidental that those three countries also have the highest population density. So let's start talking about Mexico. Mexico has, and this is debatable, more than 110 million people living there. They say about 20% of them live in the capital city. Uh, it has a GDP of $1.5 trillion. This is a very interesting figure because I don't know if you have followed the news, but China said that they're gonna invest in clean technologies between now and 2020, $1 trillion. Basically two thirds of Mexico's GDP is gonna go to clean technology. Imagine if that were to happen in Latin America, we were to invest that amount of money in developing clean technologies. The Mexico is responsible for 1.6% of the world's emissions. Uh, but right now, that, now that we're going to Copenhagen, uh, President Calderon from Mexico, he is very active in, in promoting the negotiation uh, between developing countries and developed countries. He's promoting something called the Green Fund. This Green Fund is a fund that is to be created to help developing countries to finance the fight against climate change. Uh, in order to do this and to show that Mexico is for real, uh, he has pledged and he was widely criticizing the country for doing this without asking first, uh, that they're gonna reduce emissions by 50%. Uh, that is, they're gonna bring it down from 425 from 1990 levels to 212 million uh, tons of CO2. Uh, this is, as you can see, equivalent to removing 37 million passenger vehicles from the streets in Mexico. A country that has 50 million cars wants to reduce between now and 2050 emissions, which are equivalent to removing 60% of the cars that are on the streets right now. This is an impossible situation if we were to do it just by removing vehicles or shutting down factories. So basically, the president is uh, promoting uh, uh, a number of projects, a number of uh, different programs to promote the development of clean technologies. And right now, uh, so far, Mexico is a country that is bringing the largest number of projects to Copenhagen. Next week, they're gonna start negotiating, and one of the main points of the negotiation is the Green Fund that Mexico is proposing. Uh, Mexico is also committing to, uh, to use approximately 0.56% of the GDP to fight climate change. And this does not include direct uh, investment and public-private partnerships to develop clean technology projects. So it is estimated that between now and 2020, Mexico is gonna invest close to 1.5% of the GDP in, in climate change. And when we, uh, there is a, a study that shows that if we were not to do anything right now, it's the cost of not doing anything right now, uh, could be much higher by 2020 and much more even in 2050. So right now, if a country uh, uses 1.5% of the GDP, it's gonna be less than half of what we would need to use in 2020. Uh, to fight climate change. So that's the reason uh, Mexico is proposing to use uh, that amount. Mexico has also joined, he was, uh, uh, they were the first Latin American country to join the IRENA, which is the Renewable Energy Agency. And this was done basically because Mexico is also committing to develop clean technologies, uh, committed to develop renewable energy sources. And, and here, this is a very interesting thing because Mexico is a country that lives from oil basically. Pemex is the largest uh, company in Mexico. The second one is the monopoly, the Federal Electricity Commission. And these two rely on fossil fuels to bring money to Mexico. And even then, the country is promoting the use of renewable energy. They are getting help. They're getting help from the World Bank. They're getting help from USTDA, USAID. And there is a lot of investment going to Mexico to develop clean technologies. So right now, the, the government, and I apologize, this, this slide is, is in Spanish, but basically what the government is, is saying right now is, right now we have 3.3% of the energy being produced from uh, 
convention, uh, renewable energy, and they're expecting that in the next five years, they're gonna bring it to 7.6%. They are gonna develop new wind energy projects, biomass projects for energy generation, and they're gonna start promoting the use of solar power at the residential level at this point. So when we're talking about opportunities in Mexico in the clean tech industry, we can always talk about the very large wind farms. Mexico has one of the best regions in terms of wind conditions for wind farms. Uh, it is in Oaxaca, in a place called the Istmo de Tehuantepec, and it is uh, where most of the wind farm projects are being developed in Mexico. Also in Baja California, there is another place called La Rumorosa. And most of the European companies are coming to that part to develop wind farms, but this has created a big industry, an industry for uh, wind turbines, for blades, for transporting these uh, uh, and installing them. And it's creating new jobs. Also talking about uh, what the government is doing, the government is promoting the use of solar power. Walmart is one of the first retailers who is installing uh, solar panels on the roof of all their stores. Walmart has about 110 stores in Mexico and they're saying that at least 75% of them are gonna have solar panels. So basically this is creating a huge opportunity for distributors of solar solar panels for people who are installing. And when I was talking about this at the beginning, I said that there is a nonprofit organization that is in charge of promoting the creation of high quality green jobs in Mexico. We are trying to retrain the workforce in Mexico from building televisions at the border with the US to start building solar panels to learn how to install solar panels. So this is a, a business opportunity for companies that are uh, in this area, but also it's an opportunity for a workforce or, and for Mexico to promote economic growth. Uh, another aspect that is uh, it's growing in Mexico is, is the use of hybrid vehicles. And right now, the Mexico City, the largest uh, city in Mexico, is promoting the use of electric vehicles. And this is a very interesting development, once again, because we're talking about a country that lives on oil. We're talking about a country that wants to live on oil for as long as possible. However, uh, they have the enough vision to promote the use of electric vehicles. This, it's, it's a long way before it happens, but uh, it's, it's a, the, uh, the first step in the right direction. So right now, uh, there are uh, many Chinese companies trying to enter Mexico. There are many opportunities in terms of uh, electric vehicles, and not only electric vehicles, but batteries and infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, so this uh, is just uh, a number of projects of wind projects that are being developed in Mexico. It's a total of uh, 27, I believe, and most of them are being developed by independent producers uh, in, uh, I think the translation would be like self-supply uh, type of agreement. Because in Mexico, and, and we're talking about challenges and opportunities, one of the challenges in Mexico is to get over ourselves, to be honest, and basically deal with the electricity monopoly, which is the Federal Electricity Commission. So right now it's illegal to sell electricity in Mexico if you are not the CFE, but uh, there are ways of uh, generating and selling the electricity if you define, for example, a self-supply uh, project, which is what companies like Cemex, the largest cement company in Mexico and the third largest in the world, uh, they created, they build a wind farm and they are uh, feeding uh, uh, energy to all their plants from this wind farm in Oaxaca. No? So uh, in terms of solar power, Mexico is in, in one of the, uh, best areas in terms of solar radiation. Uh, specifically, the desert in the north uh, is a perfect place for uh, solar farms. Uh, solar farms are still uh, difficult. Large-scale solar projects in Mexico are not there yet because of uh, lack of uh, regulation at this point. But uh, residential solar is uh, a new market that is opening. So right now, uh, Solar is limited just to residential and industrial uh, installations, but it is expected to, to change. And companies like San, uh, San Yu, I don't know how you pronounce it in English, uh, it's, uh, has opened a 50 megawatt plant in Mexico and they are committed with the Mexican government to not only produce solar panels for the US, but also to Mexico and Latin America starting in 2011. So right now Mexico is uh, part of the top 15 
countries in terms of solar uh, developments. Mostly thermosolar is not so much photovoltaic. Uh, right now we're talking about concentrator and water heater uh, industry. But this is a very large industry and the government finally is giving incentives. If you have a new construction, you can install solar uh, heaters and then uh, you get incentives in terms of uh, taxes. And it's uh, basically creating a, a brand new opportunity. So if we continue talking about uh, countries, and I'm going to try to go faster here because I know we're running out of time. Uh, uh, we need to talk about uh, Brazil. Brazil is the largest economy in, in Latin America. It has a population of 192 million and 1.9 trillion in terms of GDP. Uh, Brazil recently pledged a uh, reduction of 40% uh, by 2020 using 1990 as, uh, as the baseline. And as you can see, this is equivalent of removing 14 million passenger vehicles. Uh, so right now, the only two countries that have pledged in Latin America are Mexico and Brazil, but they are basically committed to reduce emissions uh, in, in an important way and setting the example for the rest of Latin America. Brazil is a country also that lives on oil. This is a country that has Petrobras, one of the largest oil companies in the world, and they just recently uh, found themselves in a nice uh, predicament because they found a lot of oil. This is a country that has been promoting biofuel for the, for the past uh, 15, 20 years, and suddenly they find incredible amounts of oil. So what, what's going to happen? Uh, right now, the president, uh, Lula da Silva, is uh, basically saying that they're going to continue promoting the biofuel industry. They're going to continue promoting investment biofuel. Brazil is the uh, number two producer and number one uh, exporter of biofuel in the world. And they are doing the same thing right now with biodiesel. They are trying to promote biodiesel uh, in the country. And by doing that, they are also promoting new opportunities for the sugar mills. And they're promoting opportunities for them to enter into uh, uh, cogeneration contracts for producing electricity based on the bagas of, uh, of the sugar cane. So right now, in terms of uh, Brazil and, and, and ethanol production, Brazil is, as I said, the, the number two in the world, number one exporter. But the very interesting data here is the amount of uh, renewal energy that is coming from the ethanol industry, from uh, cogeneration uh, plants. And this is uh, growing. And as, as you saw before, about 50% of the cars are using ethanol in Brazil. 97% of the cars in Brazil are equipped to handle ethanol. And also in, uh, in terms of cogeneration, about half of the generation of electricity in some areas in Brazil is coming from the sugar mills. So this is presenting great opportunities and uh, great opportunities for car manufacturers, also uh, the distribution of uh, biofuel, the distribution of ethanol, and the distribution of biodiesel has become a great industry in Brazil. But this is not the only industry uh, growing in Brazil that, that has opportunities. Also in terms of uh, wind generation, Brazil is the uh, number one uh, in Latin America in terms of wind power generation, uh, followed by Mexico and, and Chile. Uh, right now, uh, according to the Latin American Wind Energy Association, Brazil has uh, potential for uh, close to, well, according to them, close to 10 gigawatts uh, you know, by 2020. So this is a very large amount, enough to, enough to generate uh, one third of Brazil's energy needs. So if we continue talking about uh, opportunities, I mean, we see that Mexico has opportunities in terms of uh, biofuel, wind, solar, power. Brazil is mostly biofuel, but also wind. And in Chile, Chile is a, a very interesting country. It's a country that is not in the top 20 uh, polluters in the world, but it's a country that's trying to do something right now. They stumble upon a gold mine. They are basically stumble upon upon uh, the gray gold mine, which is lithium. Right now, electric vehicles and laptops and iPods and everybody is using lithium-ion uh, batteries. Lithium can be found in the US, in China, Australia, Chile, and Bolivia. But Chile and Bolivia have the largest reserves of lithium. And the very interesting thing is that nobody, and I mean nobody, is exploiting it right now. They uh, basically don't have the money 
to exploit it. Right now, you have Korean companies, Chinese companies trying to enter into Bolivia and Chile and try to exploit lithium. So this has created a new industry. Uh, battery makers are moving to this region of the world and they are entering into contracts with the government to develop this new industry. So lithium is a, it's a gold mine that basically became recently a, a priority for both the Ch uh, Chilean and the Bolivian governments. But also Chile is doing a lot. Chile has a project right now in the Atacama Desert. The Atacama Desert is, uh, is uh, have you heard of the Sub-Saharan uh, Solar Project? They are doing the same thing in, in the Atacama Desert. They are trying to develop the largest uh, solar farm in Latin America. Uh, and they're trying, they're gonna use the energy produced by this solar farm to bring water to the major cities. So they are trying to fix two problems at the same time. And it, it is a very interesting project. It's a project that is gonna cost a lot of money and right now Chile is getting help from the Inter-American Development Bank, from USAID, uh, in order to develop this project. And most recently, uh, this week, the wind farm Canela 2 be began operations in Chile, which also was a milestone for them, the second uh, wind farm. And this, uh, Chile is uh, one of the largest uh, copper producers in the world, and each one of the mining companies uh, is developing uh, or building uh, wind uh, power plants for their own needs. And this has created also a big industry. Right now, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of industry, uh, the wind industry in Chile is the one that is growing as a fast, at the fastest rate in the whole of Latin America. And, okay, so uh, as I was, I think I skipped this one. Right now, uh, as I was saying, in, in terms of what Bolivia is trying to do with the lithium, they estimate that they need about $800 million to exploit the resource. And this is a very interesting thing because they basically don't have the money, and right now they don't have anybody to give them the money. So they are hoping to uh, get help from the U.S. specifically, which is a funny thing when you think about the type of government they have, uh, to exploit uh, the resource. So. Uh, the other countries are, are Argentina, Colombia, and Peru. And Argentina is, is just a starting. Ar Argentina is just waking up and, and trying to get into uh, the clean tech industry too. They, uh, in Buenos Aires right now, they have some incentive programs which are really small, which are not really enough to start a brand new industry, but it is expected to change after Copenhagen. It is expected that Argentina will pledge uh, emissions reductions and for the same reason they will start developing a brand new industry. Uh, same thing we can say about Peru and, and Colombia. Both of them are developing uh, in the case of Colombia, a new ethanol industry, the government is providing incentives uh, to the sugar mills in order to start producing ethanol and start generating electricity with the bagasse, with the leftovers of the sugar cane. And at the same time, Peru is doing the same thing with biomass. Peru is, is going to the forest, getting uh, uh, forest residues to start producing uh, energy at the same time. And they are also trying to develop the first wind farm in the country. So right now, these are the countries that are investing the most, and they are trying to create a brand new industry. Uh, if, if we look at Latin America as a whole, we can see that there are specific opportunities in biofuel, solar, wind, biomass, and electric vehicles uh, in each one of the countries. Mexico and Brazil are probably the most promising in terms of, uh, in terms of these sectors and, and the growth in these sectors. But also uh, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, and Colombia present important opportunities. So right now, uh, it is expected that uh, Latin America uh, as a whole, in terms of clean tech, uh, could be 5% uh, of the total uh, global market, which is estimated at around 1.7 trillion by 2018, and 20 trillion by 2030. So right now, the opportunities are really go hand in hand with what countries have to do to meet uh, an emissions reduction target. So right now, uh, Latin America presents an important opportunity for investors. Many uh, private funds are opening. Uh, multilateral uh, funds are also uh, starting to work with the governments there to promote uh, a brand new industry in, in clean tech. Uh, 
I think with this, uh, I finished the presentation. I don't know if you have any questions or would you like to talk about anything in particular? <laughs> Hey. Um, I have a question about transmission. So you mentioned the large-scale uh, solar project in the Atacama, among others, that are really remote locations, and I'm wondering how they're addressing the issues of transmission. I, I couldn't hear the last oh, one. I'm wondering how they're addressing issues of transmission, getting oh. that power to where it needs to be from the middle of nowhere. Yes. Uh, in, in every case, uh, if we're talking about Latin America, it, there is an infrastructure problem uh, when we're talking about transmission lines. Uh, normally, European companies in, in Mexico, for, exam for example, they have developed the, the part of the transmission line that needs to be built in order to connect the wind farms or solar farms. And the same thing is happening in the Atacama Desert. They have to build brand new uh, transmission lines and interconnection sites uh, everywhere. And uh, a big uh, bulk of the cost of the entire project goes to the construction of, of the infrastructure around the solar farm, precisely. What is being done about those big dumpsters that are outside the big cities where a lot of the poorest uh, population make a living by re getting recycled items? Yeah, that, that is a business opportunity that I didn't mention that I probably should have. Uh, there are a lot of biogas projects. Uh, when we're talking about landfills like the ones outside Mexico City, for example, there are a couple of German companies that have come to Mexico that are trying to make deals with the, with the most important city governments in Mexico to create a biogas plant. So they are trying to address that problem at the same time they address the problem of electricity generation. And it is the same thing for Buenos Aires, as far as I know. Bogota, Mexico City, and Santiago. So I noticed that nuclear was a very small slice in some of the uh, displays you had. Uh, is there any consideration being given to expanding nuclear, and particularly uh, next generation nuclear plants that are less polluting and less risky? Uh, in Latin America or in general. <laughs> well, either one that you want to address. Well, in, uh, the, the quick one is in Latin America, there is no consideration. Um, and there is uh, nuclear energy is not uh, the most popular or affordable way of producing energy in, in Latin America. There are nuclear plants, but uh, I don't think uh, there's going to be new developments in that sense. And in, in terms of worldwide, uh, there is this eternal debate uh, among people who work in clean technology, whether nuclear is uh, something that we can consider clean in any way. And most people, and I include myself there, uh, do not consider it because of the waste that it produces. So I know that there are developments. I don't know enough to talk about them. Uh, and I know that here in the US, part of the uh, climate legislation uh, wants to talk about the development of the nuclear industry in the US. But that's as far as I know. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much.